this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and the past few weeks we've been discussing Passover. The contents come from the book Passover Backstory by my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss. We've got a lot of information to cover today, so I just want to hop right in. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls were going to be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait a separate check, please. My dog-eared King James Bible declares, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I am will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Later in the same chapter, God spoke, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. This presents a God working in tandem with the destroyer. In Hebrew, the term used to describe destroyer is mashchit. Mashchit. Psalm 78 provides an interesting summary of the miraculous woes that plagued the Egyptians. The death of the firstborn males was perpetrated by what appeared to be an angelic gang. Quote, he unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. The modern paraphrase in the message, uh, the Bible in contemporary language, is an idiomatic paraphrasing translation with its own foibles. The late Dr. Eugene Peterson, however, presents a creative scene around the event. I love it. His colorful view attributes the destruction from the tenth plague to, quote, an advance guard of disease-carrying angels, unquote. How it all happened is a curious enigma, but God absolutely made it happen. Both Judaism and Christianity reject the concept of dualism as understood within paganism. Unfortunately, adherents among both religions inadvertently support the philosophical underpinnings whereby dualism prospers. It is a mistake to promote the notion that there is a God of evil working in the human realm to perform his own independent will. Such a God of evil is often associated with the character introduced in Scripture known as Satan. He's commonly presumed to have his own agenda for bringing destruction and foisting evil upon mankind. Some moderns seem to believe that Satan is supernaturally empowered and functions independently like a pagan god. The religion of biblical Israel does not present the character of Satan as either independent or autonomous. Rather, the waster, or the destroyer, as the force for destruction is sometimes called, is indisputably subservient to God. The Bible says, Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. The same verse in Hebrew is particularly revealing. The Hebrew word is mashchit. It's the identical term used to describe the source of destruction in the Passover account. It was the waster called to be the destroyer 
who killed the firstborn sons of the Egyptians, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. In the Hebrew, mashkit. That same Hebrew word for the destroyer is used in both texts, identifying the God of Israel as the creator of the waster and, in fact, the same God who acted in tandem with the destroyer to bring about Israel's deliverance in the Exodus account. The God of Israel, who created life, is somehow associated with the angel of death. And that connection does not make God bad. It makes him big, very big. God is sovereign. Everything is subject to the power of God. And that is why we can trust that with God, all things are possible. The Bible is clear that Satan is an enemy of our soul. He is a real entity with some amount of real juice. His job-related skills are to lie, steal, kill, and to destroy. But he should not be given more credit than is biblical, and neither should he be underestimated or ignored. There's a reason Satan is known as the God of this world. We live in a fallen world where this fallen angel harasses mere humans. Satan is certainly a master of sin. I mean, he's been sinning longer than any other creature in God's creation. But do not be deceived. God is sovereign and Satan is subservient. In the book of Job, God called Satan to account. He is evil and malicious, but Satan holds no sway over our king. Instead of fearing Satan, we do well to fear God and to draw near to the safety of his will. Satan will ultimately be judged and punished as an enemy of God. Let's remember that it is God who judges and punishes his enemies. However, let us never forget that it is also God who forgives, redeems, and delivers. And if we can come to grips with this issue of God's sovereignty, we can avoid the theological arguments that cause us to doubt God, to diminish God, or to cast aspersions on his character. He is perfect. He is good. He loves us. God is sovereign, and neither hell nor its emissaries have any power over God or his Messiah. That is the foundation upon which my faith and the scriptures rest. By the way, my problem is not with the destroyer. My bout is not with Satan. I do not wrestle with Pharaoh. I agree with the 1970 Earth Day philosopher Pogo, who said, we have met the enemy and he is us. It might be better edited to he is me. I am my biggest problem. We must not default to Geraldine's excuse in the old Flip Wilson routine. The devil made me do it. I am not such a bad guy. I merely have a lot of leaven left in my life. So consider the profound view of a fine Jewish author. Quote, In rabbinic interpretation, Chametz is seen as symbolic of the Yetzer Hara the evil inclination. The removal is seen as a metaphor for an inner process of purging and freeing ourselves of impurity. Philo was a Greek Jewish contemporary of Jesus, and he said, leaven is forbidden on account of the rising which it causes. This prohibition, again having a figurative meaning, intimating that no one who comes to the altar ought at all to allow himself to be puffed up by insolence. But such persons may keep their eyes fixed on the greatness of God and so obtain a proper conception of the weakness of all created beings. For my fine fellow, you came naked into the world, and you shall leave it again naked, having received the interval between your birth and death as a loan from God. You know, that brief span between birth and death is a loan from God. But how does God calculate the time value of his investment in 
our lives. How do we value his loan while we still breathe? Preachers have preached about it, and we've all seen the dash on a tombstone between the dates of birth and death. We should all make the most of our lives lived during the dash. My advice is to not live it as a mad dash between chaos and cataclysm. It should be a full life complete with joy and more joy. We should have hope and find fulfillment. We should pray in faith and expect divine intervention. And of course, we will also experience unexpected challenges and opportunities to trust God. So, trust God we must, even when some questions remain unanswered. Unanswered questions can be very troubling. To my dismay, while I was diligently working to complete the manuscript for this book, I got caught in the dash with some unanswered questions. It felt like God had forced me to look at ancient realities I I just didn't want to see. As the author of this book, I needed to know the answers before I asked the questions of you, my readers and listeners. This work was essentially completed until three ugly questions surfaced. And some questions are only answered by God, and many questions have no easy answers. I invest much of my time studying the Bible. It's a passion that makes me seem odd to many people. Just when I thought this book was finished, my studies assailed me with new questions. Very bothersome questions. The entire Passover, Egypt, Moses, God, the slavery story, it all sort of twisted me up in an unexpected manner. I was totally unprepared for this, and it temporarily stopped me from finishing the manuscript to this book. I read some Bible chapters in a new light that caused me pain, uncertainty, and I'm ashamed to say even anger. I was forced to ask some terrible questions about my people and myself. Now, I assume some non-Jews have asked the first two of these questions behind our backs many times. The third question, it, it went directly to God. Quite honestly, I don't like the way I asked it, and I was extremely troubled because the answer was not in sight, and I feared I would not get an acceptable answer. So, question number one. How could the Jews have been so blind that they ignored the miracles that freed them from Egypt? Let me ask it another way. If, if you had seen God pour out deadly plagues on your enemies while miraculously sparing you, wouldn't you have paid attention to his instructions? I don't like that. Second question. I'm embarrassed to ask it, but how could the Jews have been so ungrateful that they worshipped a golden calf instead of the God that parted the Red Sea and destroyed the attacking enemy army? I mean, really, why? Why give up on a God who saved you bacon, also known as beef fry to Jewish kids of my generation? Parting the Red Sea, was, it was so epic. It even enshrined Charlton Heston in Hollywood history. The Red Sea miracle has caused believers and skeptics to marvel ever since Moses penned the news story. Yet the Jews who followed Moses acted like it never happened within weeks of their enemies being instantaneously buried in a watery grave. How did they do such a vile and grateful thing? And the third question. Why did God prescribe over 400 years of slavery to the Jews in Egypt, generations before they'd ever set foot in the land of Pharaoh? I had 
I had to ask that because it happened. God told Abraham this would happen as recorded in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. He said, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. I don't know, the, the long history of Judaism covers a myriad of Jewish heroes, victims, and scoundrels, but these three questions are focused on the era framed between the death of Joseph in Egypt and the early leadership of Moses in the wilderness. Admittedly, I, I was frustrated when I began pondering these matters. The answers to the first two questions were not satisfying. The third question, it was just paralyzing. I asked God why he sent his people into slavery for 400 years. I wondered just what had happened during those 400 years that caused God's people to become so tragically disconnected from him. These were not obvious questions and they did not have obvious answers. We know very little about what happened during our 400 years in slavery. When Joseph died, nobody in power remained to advance the cause of the Jews in Egypt. Where his life had been great under Joseph's rule, it rapidly deteriorated without his influence. Eventually, they went from losing influence to losing their freedom. And after centuries of being powerless slaves, the Passover situation suddenly transitioned to what must have seemed like a fairy tale. When Moses led the Jews out of Egypt, they departed with wagon loads carrying the wealth of Egypt. But you know, a story is lacking if it only bookends once upon a time and they lived happily ever after. The fairy tale in the middle is what excites children. Jewish history is not a fairy tale. Yet most of us are stranded with only a beginning and an end to the history of our centuries in slavery. The Bible provides scant details of these obscure centuries. History provides even less. We know the Jews fell out of favor in Egypt after Joseph's influence waned. We know bits and pieces about the earliest days of Moses as a baby under a paranoid anti-Jewish pharaoh. We know very few factoids about Moses as an adult in Egypt, except that he was guilty of manslaughter. And then later in his life, we learned of his call back to Egypt, the Exodus, and his death prior to entering the land of promise. The 400 years in between are even more silent than the so-called silent years of the much later intertestamental era. Those four centuries between the time of the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. The more I looked for answers about what happened in Egypt between the time of Joseph, the Exodus, and the Red Sea, the more discouraged I became. I mean, it just seemed so improbable. There was such a short season between God's miraculous rescue from Pharaoh and Israel's devastating disobedience. The enslaved Hebrews saw the plagues unlock the bonds of Egypt. They all walked across the parted waters on dry ground and watched their enemies instantly drown. As many as two million people witnessed one of the greatest miracles in human history. Yet instead of continued dedication to God, many Jews sunk into degradation and dishonored him very soon after their miraculous crossing. Joshua followed Moses out of Egypt. After the death of Moses, he became God's chosen leader to bring the Jews into Canaan. Joshua's specific warning provided a brief personal look into the Jews' lives in Egypt. It was written, put away forever the idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. These words were from Joshua, who had been a former Jewish slave. 
he had lived in Egypt. Joshua's brief but firsthand account confirms that the Jews in Egypt had embraced idol worship. Otherwise, the command to stop worshiping idols would have been nonsense. The fact of Jewish idolatry in Egypt was surprising to me. I mean, I guess it shouldn't have been a shock, but it was. It also answered the second question. How could they have been so ungrateful that they worshipped a golden calf instead of the God that parted the Red Sea and destroyed the attacking enemy army? Well, it wasn't merely a matter of being ungrateful. Rather, at their core, some of the Jewish slaves were simply idol worshippers. Apparently, that was what they did in Egypt. It was also what they did in the wilderness when they became afraid that Moses and his God had deserted them. The answer made me angrier. Nevertheless, I became convinced that the golden calf and idolatry were simply the default setting for some of the people who did not yet know the God of Israel or trust the God of the Bible. Wait, how could Israel trust the God of Israel? There was no nation of Israel yet. How could they trust the God of the Bible? Moses had not yet written the Bible. God had not yet identified himself to these fleeing slaves as their covenant God. Now, I'm not justifying their sin. I'm merely trying to understand and explain their behavior. Turning to idols seemed unsophisticated, ungrateful, and uncalled for. But what else would be expected of idol worshipers? Idolatry was all that some of them knew. The law of God was still on the FedEx truck when Moses crashed and broke the rockument containing God's Ten Commandments to the orgiastic people dancing around Aaron's golden calf. I concluded that the people were unsophisticated, ungrateful, and probably undressed by the time Moses shut down their party. One version of Scripture says, Moses saw that the people were naked. Another implicates Aaron as the party meister. Moses saw that the people had been committing adultery at Aaron's encouragement and much to the amusement of their enemies. Forgive me if this is all old news to everyone else. I had held my people in higher regard and blindly assumed that Judaism had been preserved in Egypt. But such idealism seems naive in the face of God's own characterization of their behavior according to the words of the psalmist, and I quote, When they were in Egypt, they paid no attention to your marvelous deeds or your wonderful love. Unquote. Realistically, the Jews in slavery were not lighting Shabbos candles or discussing the validity of Egyptian circumcision practices. They were just trying to survive. Judaism was not yet so well defined, and the Jews were no longer living a very Jewish lifestyle. They were simply poor, struggling Egyptian slaves existing in a relatively godless existence. The people of God who were led out of Egypt no longer resembled the people of God who had been led into Egypt. Centuries living in slavery in a nation which embraced idols took a costly toll on the people of God. The people of God who were led out of Egypt no longer resembled the people of God who had been led into Egypt. And this shouldn't have been a surprise, but I had never reflected on the subject. And I guess I'd never heard it discussed. This realization suggests we might do well to consider our own weakened Judeo-Christian culture. Hear me and answer this question for yourself. Have we radically deviated from what our faith requires?
Do 21st century believers resemble the people of God who promoted their faith to 18th or 19th century Americans? Do today's people of God behave like earlier generations of believers who were less connected to a culture that winks at promiscuity, adultery, homosexuality, and abortion? Was the morality of earlier Christian generations defined by social media, Hollywood stars, or perverted politicians? Of course not. Historically, the Bible set the standard for acceptable norms. The Bible was held in high esteem and used to be more respected by the government and the populace. It is no longer the gold standard of our society for defining right from wrong. In mere decades, we've seen enormous deterioration of moral standards of Western civilization and Western Christianity. Just imagine the corrosive power of centuries living as slaves in a land totally devoid of the knowledge of God. My conclusion was that the golden calf was not an aberration. It was a religious practice embraced by the Jewish slaves of Egypt. None of these thoughts had ever occurred to me. Therefore, none of them had bothered me until I was confronted with a different reading from a paraphrase of the Bible. I was sitting in a coffee shop in California, reading from the stack of Bibles I had packed. My studies were in Ezekiel. <laughs> One doesn't usually think of the Exodus account while engaging the musings of what seemed like a hallucinogenic experience of an ancient Hebrew prophet, but I was captured by the 20th chapter of Ezekiel where the prophet reported that God said, quote, I chose Israel and revealed myself to her in Egypt. Suddenly, these silent ears became less silent. Then I said to them, get rid of every idol. Do not defile yourselves with the Egyptian gods. And it was then that I realized the Jews may have already angered God way back in Egypt. But they rebelled against me and would not listen. As my mother would have said, oy vey, a pattern was revealed. They didn't get rid of their idols nor forsake the gods of Egypt. Then I thought, I will pour out my fury upon them and fulfill my anger against them while they are still in Egypt. I'm always fascinated by Jewish history and how it plays into the bigger picture. I hope you are too. If you're interested in learning about the Passover, you can check us out online, crosstalk.org or randyweiss.com. You can also reach us on social media as well. You can find us at Crosstalk TV. Until next time, shalom and God bless.